Jeannie Love. Thank you for joining me for Confidence Conversations. Thank you. So happy to talk to you today. I am so excited. And the work that you do is so impactful and we need to get your insights here today because you help your clients get stuff done and really focus in on executive functioning. So break that down. Like what is executive functioning and how do you actually help people function executively? Yeah. So executive functioning is um, are the activities that are happening in the prefrontal cortex part of your brain, uh, which is like the regulation, decision making, problem solving, self monitoring, motivation, self awareness, all those sort of like higher level tasks that involve lots of little subtasks to make them come together. And so um, my clients have ADHD or and or autism, and we work on executive functioning. And some of the things that come out of that or that what my clients want to focus on when they come to me are time management, procrastination, initiating tasks, emotional regulation, solving problems under stress, those kinds of things. They Mm -hmm. come to me feeling overwhelmed or feeling like they don't have a good grasp of time. And so those are the executive functioning skills that we kind of start with. And there's a whole lot more that goes into kind of helping them get those skills in place. That's awesome. I want to hone in right now on procrastination because I feel like everyone listening can relate. We've all procrastinated at one time or another. What are some of the primary reasons that people procrastinate? You might procrastinate. Generally, you might procrastinate because you don't, aren't excited about doing the task. So it doesn't like light you up and inspire you. Um, Maybe you don't know where to get started on the task or how to get started on the task. So that could be one of the possibilities. Um, And let's see. Oh, yeah. And then you might not be able to know how long it's really going to take to do the task. And so it seems a little overwhelming. So those are some of the reasons that we procrastinate. Mm -hmm. I know like the overwhelming piece is very real for a lot of us. So what do we do when, you know, there's something pertinent and we, we have to get it done. Right. But it is overwhelming. How do we kind of take it on and get out of our own minds and stop procrastinating? Yeah. So, um, I, there were maybe a few steps that I would recommend and I want this to be like a very conscious effort. So mindfulness being present and aware of what you're doing. This is a big part of my program. And so I want to, this to be a very conscious work that you're doing to prepare. So first you might say to yourself, I am now getting ready to do this task that I've been putting off. Okay. So now that you've owned it, you now have the power to do something about it. So you take a moment to set up your space, your workspace, have all, you know, that it's nice and tidy, put your phone just out of arm's reach. It doesn't have to be like put away, but like maybe upside down and out of arm's reach so that you can't sort of absentmindedly grab it whenever it goes off. Um, So you have your workspace set up. Make sure that you close all the tabs on your computer that you don't need, or at least, you know, create a second screen of the tabs that you do need and minimize all the other ones so that when the notification comes up that you've gotten a Slack message or an email or something like that, like try to put those aside because that will pull your attention away. So you've got your workspace set up, you've got your computer space set up. And then I would just suggest that you kind of, I have my eyes closed, you know, just take a couple of breaths into your belly and just acknowledge that you're getting ready. Oh yeah, you're doing it. Let's do it right now. Let's just take two breaths. And I don't know about you, but it just slows everything down. And when everything is slowed down, then you can say, okay, I'm ready to work. And even my voice kind of slowed down. I would say then, you know, so then you're ready to start on the task. Maybe you're feeling that sense of overwhelm. And if so, break it down into mini pieces. I mean, just little tiny sections of work that you can get done. So then it doesn't seem so overwhelming. You can kind of just start to tick them off. And as you do, maybe even reward yourself for getting those small pieces done. And by reward yourself, I mean, just get up and go get a glass of water or make yourself a cup of tea 
or, you know, just a get up and move kind of thing. And then come back, resist the urge to give in to any sort of distraction. Don't check your email. Don't check your notifications. You're still very purposeful about this task that you're doing. And all of your attention is still on that. So just a two or three minute break, and then you come back and you pick up where you left off. And oftentimes, once you've kind of gotten into that momentum, then the flow will come. And then you might even be able to go a little bit longer without having to take a break. And so that's how I kind of get into it. And then once I've done that, the procrastination kind of dissolves and you're you're in it and you're doing it. Yeah. I love that you start that with a mindfulness practice because it really does help switch the way that you're thinking about the task and just your physical being and your mental space as well. Like you literally flip a switch in your mind. And I could feel that when we just took a couple of breaths, something as simple as a couple of breaths can really help you break the habit of procrastination, which I think is wonderful. But oftentimes we don't think of, you know, executive functioning work and business tied to mindfulness unless you're you've gone through like mindfulness work or you're interested in coaching or things like that so how do you get people like is there do you ever get any resistance to the meditation to the breathing to the mindfulness piece of it i'm interested i think what i encourage people to do is to do mini mindfulness just like we just mm-hmm. practice this. So maybe if you could find like two or three emotions or emotional reactions that come up for you. Um, one for me is I, I'm an avoider and I can use busyness to avoid doing things. So there's always small tasks that need to be taken care of that can prevent me from getting into the, the big work that needs to be done. So if I can just notice that those things are happening, take two breaths catch myself, then I can come back. And so to do it over and over and over again, sounds like a lot, but it's really, as we practice 30 seconds of work, a 30 second break of mindfulness can lead to a significant chunk of productive, deep work. And so, yeah, I think people think that they don't have time. You feel like you don't have time because you're caught up in your head and the overwhelm and it's so busy. I don't have time to stop and take breaths. That's the emotional back part of your brain and and that's keeping you going and going and going and overwhelm. And if you can catch that feeling, then you've brought it to the front part of your brain where you now have power to make a decision and to do something about it. And so as many the beginning of this is to just catch that feeling as many times as you can. Oh, I love that. And I, I it brings me back the memory that flashed through my head is this is back when I was working like my last um nine to five. And I it was like the first Apple Watch I'd had. And I had these notifications that would come on like every two hours or so to tell me to like take a moment to breathe. I'm like, I don't have 60 seconds to breathe. I have to get things done. <laughs> it's like you don't have 60 seconds to breathe. Like what kind of life is that? And so now I, I, I like those notifications because they ground me, but it really is like catching the habit and catching those thoughts that are untrue. But like, we feel like the work that we're doing is, you know, so pervasive that it's like, I can't do anything else when really taking that break and tuning into that moment of self-care is what's going to make the work, the product that we're doing or working on so much better. Yeah. And I love how you called that a moment of self-care because I think we are told all the time to improve and increase our self-care to take care of ourselves. And I think too often we look at that as big things like nights out with the girls or, you know, a facial or yoga classes, something like that. And it can be this, it can just be like, I just took a moment to recenter myself And, or, you know, to get a glass of water or to make a cup of tea, I did that for me. And that is a moment of self-care and that can go a long ways to you being more productive. Because it says, Jeannie, like I deserve a cup of tea and it's okay that I have a cup of tea and something that small, like when we, cause it's something small that we get, but it's also something that small that we resist or deny ourselves. And so if we're denying ourselves of something so small, like I don't deserve a one minute break, then what else are we denying ourselves, right? If we're not even allowing ourselves a cup of tea. So I love just getting into the moment and allowing ourselves to have that space. But I want to take a step back 
and talk about okay. your journey to get to where you are, because you weren't always a coach. You actually started off in physical therapy. Yeah, it's been a quite a journey, yeah. which is fun. Um, when I look back on it, it's pretty amazing. Life is so cool. Um, I Yeah, when I went to college, I kind of, I came from one of those Midwestern families where you just went to college and got the job. And then that was your life just sort of unfolded with partners and kids and houses and all the things. So I didn't really love physical therapy, but that was what I sort of found myself in in college. So I got the degree and then, um, okay, so I'll keep the story moving. Yeah, I had this crazy moment that happened to me, a failure, which was so amazing, which was that I failed my physical therapy licensing exam and I'd never failed anything before. And so this was a oh my God, what am I going to do now kind of moment because I couldn't take the test again for three months. Mm -hmm. And so it was this huge shakeup in my life. I wasn't living in a place that I loved living. Um, I wasn't dating someone that was really healthy for me. So it was like this huge disruption in my life, which caused me to kind of, I'm a mover, like a, a doer. I like change. And so I left <laughs> and I moved and I moved states. I moved, you know, across the country. And so you know, life happened and I found myself with my physical therapy background working in schools with very high needs students who had Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, um, very significant autism, those kinds of things. So I, I was there. I was the special education teacher for 20 years. Um, I moved out of the significant needs into kids who are a little bit higher functioning. And that's where I really found a love for students who have ADHD and autism. So I did that. Um, and so the whole education was about 20 years. I also ended up living in South America and teaching an, uh, a student who has autism down there. Okay, so then the story wraps up with COVID bringing us back from South America and a reevaluation of what I want out of the second half of my career. And I realized that public education wasn't going to give me what I was looking for. And so I found that adults are now diagnosing themselves or seeking a diagnosis of ADHD and autism. And then they want coaching. They need help now to understand who they are, how their brains work, and how to maybe tackle some of these things that have held them back. And so I started a coaching program and I love it. It's great. I've been enjoying it. And I'm yeah. growing and, and learning and yeah, it's awesome. I love it. I love the story because it just shows like how everything your, your life kind of built on one another. And it really illustrates the fact that nothing is a mistake or a failure. Like sure, you didn't pass the exam per se, but it, everything that you did was so needed and necessary for you to be where you are today and to impact all of the lives that you're impacting through your coaching. Yeah. And I have actually another example that I like to think about when, when I feel like things aren't falling into place or things are confusing, or I don't know where I'm going or what I'm doing. I remember that there was another sort of huge setback. The reason that we moved to South America was because my daughter was um, in daycare and it was wildly expensive and we were struggling to make ends meet my husband and I. And so he came up with this idea that he would be a stay-at-home dad and I would teach living in another country. And so we did that. And it was the most profound experience of my life, of my daughter's life, who was so young at the time. And so it's like those setbacks, those times where it looks really bad, yeah. that like change, it feels like it's on the horizon. Like it's coming if you're open to taking the next step. Oof that last phrase, if you're open to taking the next step is so huge because when we're in those places and those spaces and times in our lives, it's intimidating. Like, and it can feel scary in the moment, even if you know consciously that, you know, you're going to get through it, you know, things are on the horizon. Being there in that moment can be very intimidating. So how did you guys get through it? And how did you know in the moment that you know, it's okay to open myself up to this new and different experience. Well, it was my husband's idea, but he's um, like, we live in Colorado. He's a Colorado boy. He loves it here. And so 
and as I said before, like I love change and new things. And so when he mentioned that to me, I said, just, you need to hold on for a second. Cause if you're serious, like I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And so we had that conversation, but another struggle that came along with that then is interviewing with, you know, schools all over the world, thinking about what is the best fit for my family and for my career. And so there were a lot of ups and downs with that interviewing and not getting offers or interviewing and getting offers, but in the place we didn't want to live. And so that was also kind of a roller coaster. But what I found and what I've the pattern that I see in all of this is just hang on, just hang on. Mm -hmm. It's coming if you just hang on. And it took a whole year or maybe even two years before the one that we knew was the right one popped up. And then we knew this was the one for us. And so that's what I found. Be open, be curious, ask questions, try things. You can always say no later and then just wait for the right thing. You'll know when yeah. it's there. I love that. And I, I really like the illustration that you gave of like just hanging on it's coming. Because like what even if we perceive something as a failure, right? Failure can only resist persistence for so long. Like persistence is like a knife and failure is like a wooden plank. Like eventually that the knife is going to break through the plank if you keep going. And so I love that you guys did that. So did your experience at all define or reshape the way that you view success? Yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but yes. I mean, living life. Well, at the same time, when I was in South America, that was when I started learning about mindfulness. So I think this comes with it. And with mindfulness, I really learned a sense of like peace and contentment and joy with where you are and what you have. I feel like at least in the culture that I grew up in, it's constantly striving for more and more and more. And this was like to let go of some of that, to, to just appreciate what is in front of you instead of always looking ahead to the future. Um, and so I think maybe that's how I have come now to define success is that I am at peace I feel good. This is working. It's all okay. It doesn't need to be more or bigger. It mm -hmm. will be, but I don't have to continue to strive, you know, endlessly yeah. and use all of my energy for it. Yeah. It's that like middle ground of like doing the work, but not to the point of like where you're striving and like not going with the flow. It's like the flow almost. Yeah. Yes, the flow. And it 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 can be hard to hold on to. <laughs> and so you have to come back to it, you know, much as mindfulness, you have to come back to it over and over and over again when you forget it or lose it. So I want to jump back to the work that you're doing with your, your clients and talk about mindfulness and success because people come to you to help them GSD, get stuff done. And you know, it can be difficult when you're maybe not seeing the results that you want right away. So how do you help them shape their view of themselves and also their view of success along the way? First thing that we have to understand is that we've spent the length of our lives building the neural pathways in our brain. And if you have ADHD or autism, not only did you grow up and, and learn the patterns of thinking and behaviors from your family and from your environment, but also you likely are carrying some baggage from having really struggled at school. It goes all the way back to school. And then maybe you tried secondary education or you got your first job. Maybe you struggled with that. Like a lot of my clients have been struggling for a really long time. So what we have to do is start to build new neural pathways in your brain. So we're building new habits and to build new habits. So I like to describe those old habits, those no old pathways as like super highways because your brain has just automatically responded that way for your whole life. And it's just been getting smarter and faster. And what we're and in order to build a new pathway, it's going to need as much practice really 
I mean, maybe not as much practice, but very intentional practice so that that way of doing things, that way of thinking about yourself, um, that way of slowing down gets the stronger, more attention and the other one gets a little weaker. So it's like taking a little path through the woods and building it up so that it gets as strong. So the mindfulness aspect is to come back again without judgment on yourself over and over and over. When you lose your way, when you fall off and revert back to old habits, come back over and over and over again. And then also we'll tackle those emotions that you're carrying with you, being less than, why does everybody else have it together? How come I'm the only one who can't be on time or I don't relate to time and start to just own those and let go of them and be okay with who you are. So Mm -hmm. there's that sort of positive emotional intelligence that we work on as well. Yeah. I want to talk a bit more about that because there's one you know, it's one thing to recognize that that's going on, right? And to identify like, okay, I can be gentle with myself, but how do we do that when it does feel like, okay, I'm behind and I'm not keeping up. And this is what society or parents or whomever is expecting of me. So there's the emotional intelligence piece, but how do we put that into practice and give ourselves a bit more grace? So one aspect of that would be sort of like your watch going off regularly to give yourself some time. So a a mindfulness practice, like two minutes or even one minute of mindful breathing, mindful listening, just being present and not allowing your thoughts to carry you away to the future or the past. So do that throughout the day as many times as you can. So that's part of it because now you're building up that present that muscle in your brain of being present, that pathway in your brain of, no, I'm here right Mm -hmm. now. So the practice being present and then the next task is to identify those sort of negative emotions Mm -hmm. that are popping up because then it's no longer an emotion. It's again in the decision-making part of your brain. It's really hard to catch it when it's happening in the beginning. If this is new to you, you might start with reflection, like looking back afterwards, like, oh, that just carried me away. I could have done this. All right, next time I'm going to try this. The idea is that you will catch that emotion. You will name that emotion. You will be present with that emotion. And then you can do a very short mindfulness practice to kind of send it away and be present. That emotion is whether that emotion is something about the past or the future. It's also not serving you right now. The goal is to get to this point where you can catch it, Mm -hmm. call attention to it, do something about it with a little mindful breathing and then send it on its way so that you can get back to work. Oh, that's really awesome. And I I actually just read um, Letting Go and I can't remember the author's name right now. I want to say it's Dr. like David Hawkins. I'm not sure. But He talks about like really understanding and tuning into those emotions that you're having, especially like the lower energy emotions. And he doesn't say necessarily to name them, but to be able to call them out and then like ask why and get inquisitive about them. And it like really meshes well with what you're saying, because unknowingly we're bringing it back to that, the the front part of our head. We can decide, do I believe this? Is this valid? Is this serving me? And also at the same time, if we're asking that why, like if we're tacking on that question, we're able to like debunk that myth, like whatever that is, because we realize, you know, that's something in the past that doesn't resonate. That was a label that was assigned to me. It doesn't resonate. That's something that's not true for right here and right now. It doesn't resonate. And so we're able to like keep doing that. So I just love that you were able to it's just like a nice synchronicity. Yeah, I love it. I'll have to check out that book, but it definitely sounds like it resonates with the work that I'm doing and could probably learn from it. So what is self-love to you? Oh, self-love goes, I think, to that idea of just being okay. You're okay. To me, that's the root of it. Like if I can just be okay with the imperfect being that I am, but who has these gifts to offer, and that can be the hard part, is to find those gifts and to remember those gifts when we're being really hard on ourselves and grace 
just forgiveness, okayness. I'm just kind of breathing into my stomach to feel that because that's where I carry. I carry all my emotions, my negative emotions in my stomach. So yeah, take that moment to like in the book, let it go. Just like take that moment to figure out what that thing is and recognize that it's not serving you and be okay with who you are and what you're doing and know that you are enough. I actually wanted to say too, that brings up, and this is, I always kind of like, wasn't really into like the affirmation kind of thing. It seemed a little like hokey to me, yeah. but I heard it, but I've started it and I've started listening to them and uh, participating along, you know, with recordings. And then I heard someone say the other day, this respected teacher that we've been telling ourselves negative affirmations our whole lives. And so why wouldn't we give ourselves the positive affirmations. Like we tell ourselves negative things over and over and over. And that's why those pathways are so strong in our brain. Why not take the time to build up the positive ones by telling ourselves good things? And so, you know, consider adding that to your life as well, because it's, it's really just a, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm enough. Yeah. What I have to offer is good. So what are some of your favorite positive affirmations? I would love to hear. Um, I have a tendency to, um, work. Like I just, like I said before, like this striving to continue and grow and be doing more. And also, you know, the, one of the reasons for leaving public education and starting a coaching business was to be more available for my daughter. Mm -hmm. And so the one that I'm doing right now is to kind of tell myself that the work that I'm doing is enough Mm -hmm. and that when she needs me, I don't need to panic about what I'm not getting done, that I'm here for her and what I'm doing is enough. And so I feel like that's the one I keep telling myself over and over again, like, this is good. What I have. Oh, I have another story to tell um, about enough there. And I'm not going to get the story correct, but it's, there's a famous author and he's going to a very wealthy man's home for a party. And he's walking in with his friend and his friend says to the author, he says, how does it feel to be looking at this man's life? He earns more in one day than you will earn in your lifetime. And the author says, I have something that he doesn't have. I have enough. Mm. That just like resonates with me. It's like, yes. That's so beautiful. Oh man, that gave me chills just now. Um, And I think, you know, it resonates because I feel that way too. I don't have children yet, but I find myself working all the time and coming up with new projects and doing this and doing that. And like when it's time to take a break and I will schedule time for breaks, will sometimes feel like, you got to get back to work or like, if you're not like, if you don't work, you don't need or like all of these different things. And it's just not the case. And like knowing that you're enough and that what you're doing is enough keeps you in flow. And it also resets your energetic frequency to understand too, that, you know, you do your part and then the rest is attracted to you in a way, but like you can't overcompensate and do everything because then you're pushing up against a wall. Yeah. I love that energetic reset, which we need. Yes. Because then it feels like your head is down, your shoulders are kind of rounded and you're just like eyes to the ground pushing instead of looking around open-minded and ready for new things to come in. And so, yeah. So how do we balance, right? That sense of I'm doing enough, right? And I am enough as I am with the big goals that we have for ourselves that we know are possible. So how do we balance that? Like, I want to get here, but you know, I also want to feel balanced in where I am. I think I really recommend, I did this Mm -hmm. when I was trying to figure out before I had really created this coaching program, I was thinking about what do I want? from my life. Like I'm in the second half of my career teachers that I've worked with, that I worked with 20 years ago, they're like counting down the days to retirement. You know, that's, that's kind of how it works maybe to work in sort of a agency like that, the government or whatever. But I'm like, well, I got 20 years left. You know, I, I, I don't want to do that. So then it was I very consciously, very effortful wrote like, what is important to me? What do I want financially? What do I want for my family? What do I want for myself? What do I want? Yeah. And then I can come back to that over and over and over. 
Mm -hmm. because we will lose sight. You will get caught up in whatever emotions. And if you, I mean, find like one of those um, visualization meditations where they talk you through like really seeing and smelling and feeling what your goals are and do that over and over again until you have a very solid picture of what you want and why it's important. And then you can come, it's like a vision board. Or you can do a vision board too, where you can just come back to it over and over again to reset, reprioritize. And I mean, I had to do it this morning because I kind of got caught up in the work Mm -hmm. with like my own personal work and my daughter was struggling this morning and I lost my temper. So now I got to go back. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are my priorities? Why did I let myself get carried away and reset? Yeah. I love that. And I love the idea of even if it's not a vision board, like having something written out where you go through each of those priorities for each part or pillar of your life, because that really serves as your like goalposts or like this, you know, sign or signal up upon the distant road where you can look and say, okay, like, am I still headed in the right direction versus am I going in the opposite direction because I got distracted? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So this is Confidence Conversation. So I want to know, what does confidence mean to you? I think it goes back to just being okay with who you are. Mm -hmm. And when you forget that you are enough, uh, to just look around you and remember that, I mean, everybody's got their thing, their hangups the thing that's holding them back. And so do you, and not to get caught up in the picture of how good someone looks like they've got it all together. Everything is just know that we're all working on this together. And I have these, and it's so hard because we can forget that the things that we're good at, not everybody is good at because Mm -hmm. something comes easily to us. We just assume that it's easy for everybody but it's not like when I started this coaching business, it's the same thing. Like, do I really have something to offer that nobody else that other people don't have their, you know, have that all together for them. And it's true. And so everybody has that gift and you do too. And so recognize that gift and know that you are enough and go forward and fake it till you make it right. Just kind of like, Yeah. Just like, no, I've got this, even though you don't feel like you've got this, but I've got this and just go forward. And then, then you'll find out that you do and confidence will come slowly. in. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Any final words of wisdom you have for us today? I would say, I guess maybe what I would love for you, for your audience to take away from this is just take the time to be present through a mindfulness practice and catch those emotions whenever they're coming in, you know, even in talking about confidence, whether it's imposter syndrome or feeling less than, and breathe into those emotions, welcome them, and then be like, I see that you're here, but Mm -hmm. I don't have time for that right now. So you're going to have to go and you breathe them away. I love that. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It was fun talking to you.